right, I uh, said that this morning we'd be looking at uh, the historical Jesus of violence and peace. Violence continues to be one of the major concerns for, for humanity. We have, as humans, in spite of all of the discoveries, the advancements in science, a government, and education, we still live in a violent world. Our sister Rosalia's brother-in-law was executed. So this is an issue. Now for believers, uh, we have a remedy for this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And it, it's inspired by uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Violence. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Why violence in a world? And what's God's remedy? I've heard people say over the years, why doesn't God do something? Now listen, uh, according to our tradition that we share with the, our Jewish brothers and sisters, God's creation starts off good, and actually very good, as you read, read uh, on, according to Genesis 1. In fact, out of an incredible explosion, Big Bang, we ultimately get a good earth. Figure that one out. <laughs> With an environment to support and nourish abundant life forms. Really something to contemplate <coughs> as believers. Nature is amazing. Not only amazing because of the way it supports life in God's creation, but it's beautiful, as we were just reminded by these pictures. And we should be thankful for that. Reminders of God, according to Psalms 119. Stories of Genesis also indicate that the Creator partnered with the humans in the care and preservation of Earth's environment and all its life forms. Genesis 3. But something happened. The Earth and the Creator got sabotaged by God's partners. Ironically, the humans. God was victimized, the God of the Bible, by the, by the corruption of humans. So let's be clear, be clear about something. Bad things are not, if we follow our story, bad things are not a part of God's will. Storms, earthquakes, and predation. Predation is animals eating animals to survive. I don't believe that's part of God's original will. So what's God to do if we look at our tradition? First of all, notice that God grieves. He mourns. He weeps. A sorrowful and broken-hearted God exclaims, I regret creating the humans. That's how bad. Now, by the way, have you ever said in a moment of frustration or pain, I'm sorry I had kids? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> now, most parents who say that don't really mean it, do they? Just like, uh, I'm going to kill you for that. You know, it's uh, hyperbole. Maybe not improper. Well, how do we know that parents... Uh, don't really mean it. Well, I think we know because of the way parents go on and treat and nourish their children. They don't put them up for adoption usually, and they don't neglect them. And by the way, neither did God. God did not abandon humanity after they betrayed God, according to the story. 
In fact, the rest of the Bible is a story, an account of God's loving acts of redemption to those who betrayed him and made him a victim of their own corruption and violence. Let's keep the story straight. I love the fact that the rabbis say the most victimized person in the Bible is God. But nonetheless, he comes back into human history. Not as creator, but as redeemer. And he decides to work with the humans to get us to partner again to help mend the hurting world. Now, <clears throat> the rest of the Bible is a story about God's mercy for humans. Not because they or we deserve it, but because of God's chesed, a Hebrew word that means his deep-seated love for humans in relationship. According to the Bible, chesed is the, is the glue in the relationship. If it wasn't for God's act of mercy, there wouldn't be any relationship. It's God reaching out and embracing us over and over and over again. Not us. It's God's chesed. It's God's love and mercy. Let's be clear about that. One of my favorite biblical stories about God's undeserved love and mercy for, for the scoundrel Jacob and his relationship to his twin brother Esau in Genesis 27. Great story. Go back, read it if you've got time uh, in, uh, during commercial or something on a uh, football game today. <laughs> Start to read Genesis 27. <clears throat> now recall this drama. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau came out of the womb first, and by that tradition, as the eldest son, or the oldest son, he was to receive his father Isaac's inheritance, passed down to the first son. But, as you know, a blind Isaac on his deathbed summoned Esau, before I bless you with the family inheritance, and Esau was known as a great hunter, go out and hunt, and then cook me a succulent meal, and then I will bless you, Esau, for the inheritance. Esau jumps up, goes out. Meanwhile, who hears, it? Who hears uh, uh, Father Isaac give him that instruction? His wife, Rebecca. What does Rebecca do? She goes to Jacob and says, Hey, the old man's about ready to bless your older brother. I'll tell you what. We'll dress you up like Jacob, put a hairy mantle on you, rub some animal grease on you. I'll cook a suckling meal. You go in, <clears throat> pretend like you're Esau, and get the blessing. He goes along with it. He comes in, blind uh, Isaac. You know, feels you know, feels like Esau, smells like Esau, must be Esau. So he blesses him. Now, according to that tradition. Jake, he got the blessing. He got the inheritance. He stole it from his brother. But that's the way it went. According to this story. Upon hearing it, big, rough and tumble hunter Esau vows to kill his brother. Jacob being the smart uh, computer type guy <laughs> decides, you know, I better get out of town. So he flees. He goes to, to another land to live with his uncle Laban, see if he'll take him on. <laughs> on the way, he stops at a, a, a well, sees a beautiful young Jewish maiden there named Rachel, uh, like lovely lamb. He instantly falls for her, kisses her, goes to Laban, says, I've got to marry Rachel. Well, hey, you know, uh, all right, work seven years for me. He works seven years diligently, uh, knowing that he's, you know, hoping he, that, uh, that he'll be able to marry his beloved Rachel. He comes back to Laban, and he says, all right, seven years, start the, start the wedding. I'm ready to marry Rachel. And Laban says, Rachel, what are you talking about, man? I can't marry the, the, the younger daughter before the older sister, Leah. That's just not how we do things. Right. You've been working for Leah these seven years. <laughs> Now, by the way, Leah means something like long neck giraffe. <laughs> so he works another seven years and marries. 
Now, the interesting thing about the story, Jacob, who betrayed uh, his brother in deception, he's getting blessed. All this time, uh, and by the way, Leah is giving him children and none from Rachel yet. And uh, he's, he's uh, prospering, and he's prospering, and, and all of a sudden, one day he says, I'm going back. I'm going back to face my brother. Now, Laban, by the way, didn't like that because all of that loot was going with him. But here goes Jacob, his family, his entourage, all the wealth, they're going back. And as they're going back, here comes Esau, the big, rough, and tumble brother who vowed to kill him. The outdoors guy, the hunter. And he said, remember the story, Jacob says, no use to everybody getting slaughtered here. Let me face him. So Jacob goes out. Esau comes rushing up to him. And Jacob is expecting a dagger in the gut. And he's blown away because his big brother, who he betrayed, falls on his neck and kisses him. It, it blew him away. He, you know, he got, I picture him staggering back. What? what just and he says, in you, seeing your face, by the way, this is the face that only a mother can love, and apparently the mother didn't love that face <laughs> all that much. Seeing your face is like seeing the face of God because you've shown me favor, you've accepted me. Now, I would suggest that this is a story about forgiveness and mercy. Because, listen, if Jacob would have died there, he was the rightful patriarch in the story of Israel. The story of Israel would have ended with Jacob's death. But because of the mercy of God, Jacob is spared and all of Israel is spared. And lo and behold, one day the Messiah comes. And here's a story, one of many stories, not New Testament, but Old Testament, where God's mercy and forgiveness overcome hatred and violence. Do we believe it's still possible? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And from the least likely source comes God's expression of mercy, Esau. A man of violence becomes a man of reconciliation. Is there hope for the world? This story says there is a God. Now, how many times do you think Jesus of Nazareth heard this story? Surely Jesus understood God as a God of mercy. Truly, Jesus must have believed with his whole being that God's love and mercy could overcome violence and hatred. Surely Jesus believed that with all his heart. And notice Jesus enters a world still filled with corruption and violence. Even the birth stories, Herod is killing two-year-olds. Jesus and his family, according to Matthew's Gospel, have to flee to Egypt. This is a violent place that Jesus enters. But Jesus grows up saying, turn the other cheek. Forgive your enemies. In fact, do good to them. In John's gospel, Jesus is warned. Hey, they killed your cousin John. They're coming after you to kill you, man. That's the world that Jesus lived in. Pouring his heart out in, 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 in acts of mercy and forgiveness. And what's he get for it? He goes into Jerusalem. In an act of peace. And he's arrested. And when they arrest him in the garden, one of the his own disciples, Peter, cuts the ear off of one of the arresting party. And what does Jesus say? All right, I guess we're gonna have to fight. And he says, Enough! No. Then Jesus stands before a corrupt court. He faces a trial. That was a farce of a trial. And then he's crucified as a revolutionary. That's what he gets in a world like this. Have we forgotten? 
The Prince of Peace and his movement, however, <clears throat> has overcome violence and established peace wherever this gospel is preached and believed by the people. That's why it is the hope of the world, not what's going on in Washington. How does this message and example of Jesus impact your life? I believe modern science is right. We are violent by nature. In our reptilian brain or brain stem, <laughs> Powerful emotions, including anger and violence, come from there. Unless there's something else to control us. Let me close with this. André Trocmé was a French Protestant minister <coughs> at a French village called Le Chabon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During the Second World War, he inspired his little French village 5,000 basically peasant farmers to help rescue over 5,000 Jewish children from the Nazis. Andre Trocme paid for that with his life. And one thing that's very interesting that he said about himself, he said, I'm a violent man controlled by Jesus. How about you and me? How about you and me? In our face, or faces, do people see the mercy of God? Does a loving Savior control our life, even when we have the urge to hate and act out violently? Followers of Jesus must. And the, and the reward for that is peace on earth. Amen. Amen. Amen.